Thank you all for being here. This is such a proud moment for me because our book uh, was just published actually last week. And so the timing of this book launch is very fortuitous, uh, coming uh, on the, uh, right just before the Global Congress. And it turns out that eight of the contributing authors, or nine if you include me, are actually attending the Congress and all of us are here today. So it's a fantastic opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we hope this, uh, this book uh, will um, accomplish and will teach us all about the intersection of public-private partnerships or PPPs, P3s, intellectual property governance and sustainable development. I know that's a mouthful. Uh, so, of course, we're hoping, we were hoping when we started this project that it would be a bestseller, um, and it probably will not uh, reach a John Grisham-like status, but um, we do think that it has really, really great, solid content that's really important in thinking about intellectual property governance or regulatory frameworks moving forward. And that's because public-private partnerships, while not very well understood, uh, or analyzed or discussed uh, in a critical fashion have become uh, not only em emerging but already embedded forms of institutional, hybrid institutional sort of arrangements that uh, both implement and impact intellectual property policies in a variety of different ways. And those, that variety will be evident to you as you listen to each of the speakers, each of the eight other authors on this panel. So I wanted to thank them for all of their effort and their contributions to this sort of project of increasing our knowledge about this intersection or what I call the triple interface. And uh, just uh, let everybody know that the format is going to be that each speaker will have five minutes, including myself, uh, and just to essentially give you a very brief, concise, and hopefully um, moving message about what, what their chapters uh, really are all about. And it's a complex space, even for people who are interested in intellectual property, who understand the policies, uh, to really sort of wrap our heads around. And so I'm hoping that one of the purposes of this, uh, this panel, this book launch, this celebration, will be to allow people to, to understand more, to comprehend more of, of this um, complex area. So, just a little bit about the genesis of this, which is about seven years ago. Um, that's how long book projects take. But as with many of my great new ideas, I, I learned about the uh, importance of public-private partnerships from one of my former students who was working in a nonprofit biomedical research institution in Seattle, one of the many funded by uh, a very important foundation in our, in our uh, area of the world, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And he's no longer there, he's moved on, but he and I both shared an interest in public health. He had gone to the Columbia uh, School of Public Health, I had gone to the Michigan School of Public Health, each of us before going to law school, and we still retained an abiding interest in issues of intellectual property policy uh, with regard to global, or what, what was then called international health when I was going to school. And so I had a eureka moment that this was an area, public-private partnerships, of which very little was actually known and it, was, it seemed like a great topic for a book project, bringing in lots of different perspectives. I'm somewhat agnostic still at this point about the impact of partnerships, uh, but the perspectives in the book uh, range from critical to, uh, to encouraging, um, supportive of the work that uh, PPPs can do in promoting public interest goals in intellectual property, particularly in the global space, but also on the national levels. Um, and so my Eureka moment, fortunately, was translated into um, reality, and it was actually at one of these global congresses. I'm, I can, I'm probably one of a, a handful of people who can brag to, uh, bragging rights um, to having attended all five of these global congresses. And each one has, all, all, uh, has built upon the preceding ones in very wonderful ways. It was at one of these global congresses, the one in Rio, and I wasn't even a featured speaker, I think. I just happened to be tagging along. But uh, I ran into one of my co-editors, Ahmed Abdel Latif. It was a very dark, rainy night. I know that sounds like the beginning of a novel. <laughs> and uh, I saw this guy you know, walking towards me with an umbrella, and I was walking towards him with an umbrella along a narrow sidewalk. And I kind of peeked up, and there, was, there he was. 
And we decided that we would have dinner that night to um, brainstorm about a book project. And that's really where that happened at one of these global congresses. And as I, as I said, that was about six years ago. Fortuitously enough, that coincided with the end of the Millennium Development Goals, which were in effect from 2000 to 2015. And when I submitted the book proposal to Cambridge University Press, it was at a time when the Sustainable Development Goals had just been adopted by the United Nations General Assembly and were being implemented. And so we just hit the timing absolutely right. Uh, and um, the book now is really organized around the SDGs and the ways in which intellectual property can impact uh, those goals. So um, I want to end by thanking my co-editors. Neither of them could be here, although both were uh, hoping that they could make it. Uh, Pedro Rofe at the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development, who has been a mentor and um, it was on my bucket list um, for my professional life to work with him on a major project and I've done that and I really thank him for everything that uh, he's provided in terms of mentorship and support, as well as Ahmed, who uh, also was very, very encouraging, um, particularly at the beginning stages of this project. So with that, I'd like to turn to my speakers, and as you can say, we see we have a wide variety, uh, wide array of speakers, and I will say one last thing. I'm very proud of the diversity, not only of perspectives but uh, and points of view, but of gender and, and uh, nationality and um, global south versus global north perspectives represented in this book, uh, and I think you'll enjoy their presentations as well. So with that, I'd like to move to my next speaker, Padma Sri Gal Sampath. Thank you, Maggie. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, um, I should say that I'm, I'm honored to have been part of this book project. And I'd like to thank uh, Maggie Chon, um, Pedro Rafi, and Ahmed Abdul Latif, actually, for the, I mean, it was really a great experience. It was really nice and collegial. So um, now I'll give you a, a, a very short overview of, of my chapter. Uh, my chapter looks at the issues of uh, PPPs and technology sharing whether we are move, heading the right way or if there are uh, new design issues that we need to tackle. So um, the starting point for my work in the book was, um, it began from the thought that, you know, there's so many loosely structured arrangements that we call public-private partnerships today. So what does this really mean from a governance perspective? How do you begin to compare these arrangements, you know? Uh, what do you actually make, how do you make sense of them? Are they all trying to, they're all trying to do more or less the same thing, but they're all structured differently. So are there any lessons we can take home? What are the best practices and wh where can we change things, you know? So I began by, with that thought, and I looked at international PPPs, which are basically the kind of PPPs which have been structured since after the TRIPS agreement to deal with major global public goods issues. And I looked at uh, trying to understand the state of the art of PPPs. So I did that by conducting a sort of a um, systematic bibliometric research on how many PPP related articles exist from 2005 to 2016 in peer reviewed journals, and how many of them deal with issues of public private partnerships, intellectual property, and technology in the same breadth, meaning. I looked for key searches, so there, there are methodologies to conduct these kind of uh, bibliometric analysis. So I looked at collaboration, learning, technology transfer, PPPs, IP, as my five keywords. And then I found uh, about 8,000 articles, then you narrow it down and you sift through, you come to about 1,000 something, and then you narrow it down further, you only find 82 articles dealing really with these issues. And then I went through each one of these 82 articles to see what is happening, and then linked it to the existing PPPs that we see. And I just want to give you a sort of a very short summary of what I found. So what I found is that there are three kinds of things that PPPs deal with, and they're all different. One is the ownership structure. The second is in the way they define innovation. Most PPPs define innovation really in terms of this end product or something that they are supposed to deliver. And the third is in the way they define the IP arrangements. And I found that actually you have a broad spectrum. You have certain PPPs that work towards open collaboration. 
You have others where you already have very defined rights on IP. And both of these do not deal with you know, uh, neglected diseases or you know, of problems that are really of relevance to the developing world or the global community. And those PPPs, the very few that deal with those problems, they approach IP issues in a hybrid way, which means that there is an IP negotiation package, but it's always left open for the next stage. And this re opened up a lot of issues that we deal with in the paper. The question is, is this the right way to approach it? What are the, the differentiated impacts on technological learning and technology sharing during the course of the PPPs? Can the PPP not be designed in a better way from the start so that we can actually get the maximum technology benefits from the partnership over the course of the partnership? What does it really mean, for instance, if you have an international PPP where people come with completely different social, cultural backgrounds, but also different expectations. Why should countries, when we say value for money in PPP, why should we not measure it from the perspective of getting the maximum out of the PPP, not just in terms of the derived product, but also in terms of what it could mean for technological learning for countries. And then the chapter derives some of the ways in which we could conceptualize technology transfer and technological learning issues in the future and proposes a way to look at it in terms of technology sharing. So what I propose is that, you know, because technology transfer debates are always cons construed in a hierarchical way. There is a, somebody who is going to give the technology and somebody who's going to receive the technology. And that skews the way we set the incentives for all technology transactions, including something as well-meaning as a PPP. If we change that to a technology sharing perspective, where there's a collaboration, you know, and you talk of a collaboration from the start of the partnership, you would construct the PPP in a different way. And these are the kind of issues that the chapter deals with. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, presenting our chapter today on behalf of the lead author, Professor Chidi Oguamanam, my close friend and colleague at the University of Ottawa. And we co-wrote this chapter uh, on behalf of a group of um, people who lead the Open African Innovation Research Network, uh, Open Air. Uh, Caroline is here in the audience, Tobias is here at the Global Congress, uh, Nagla Rizk unfortunately couldn't make it, but many of us might be familiar uh, to you. You've heard about the Open Air Project in this um, body, the Global Congress, before, um, if you were in Cape Town and attended the third Global Congress. We decided to write a chapter about the partnership um, that we work in because the literature on public-private partnerships tends to be dominated by analysis of very specific interventions focused on large-scale infrastructure projects or complex R&D problems or product delivery issues. And we wanted to look at a different kind of public-private partnership, which is a research network or a research partnership where the output or the purpose is not um, to uh, deliver a specific product or to uh, complete a particular infrastructure um, initiative, but rather to uh, build human capital and capacity around intellectual property research. So the chapter talks about uh, some of the defining features of uh, open air as a public-private partnership. And I thought I would just run through a, a list of those quickly for you here. Um, for starters, it's a cross-sectoral partnership, and that may seem evidence from the fact that it's public and, and private, but it brings together a consortium of research funders from um, the International Development Research Center to Open Society Foundation to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, along with um, uh, philanthropic foundations like the Shuttleworth Foundation and other funders like Germany's GIZ, and combines those resources with the capacity of uh, universities in, um, in a number of countries in Africa and Canada. So in addition to the University of Ottawa, our Canadian hub, We've got roots at the University of Cape Town, the University of Johannesburg, Strathmore University in Nairobi, American University in Cairo, and the Nigerian Institute for Advanced Legal Studies in Lagos and Abuja. And um, through those I institutional hubs, we connect to um, 
private sector lawyers working in practice, NGOs and think tanks, intergovernmental organizations in 15 different African countries and then globally um, in Canada, the United States and uh, Switzerland and, and elsewhere. So that's really quite unique, that cross-sectoral constellation of actors that we've brought together. Um, I mentioned or alluded to the fact that it's cross-regional. It's not just um, uh, based in one country, let alone uh, one region, but rather across developed and developing countries um, and across the global north and across the global south. We think that's quite important because it reflects something unique about our approach. A typical intellectual property capacity building project will take resources from the global north and purport to train um, people in the global south or to deliver capacity to the global south. That is the antithesis of what we're trying to do. And in fact, we're trying to create um, a mutual opportunities for benefits to flow in multiple directions. Um, and for Canadians in particular, we're interested in what we can learn from the countries of Africa about intellectual property. It's um, not just interdisciplinary, but transdisciplinary. We take a problem-based approach. We've got uh, unique methods grounded in empirical research techniques um, to create theories from what we observe on the ground, not to just test existing theories and how they'll work. Um, and, and we've really leveraged a sort of a network of network models. So many of us are part of commu broader communities like this Global Congress, and that's been very effective. Uh, there are many challenges that we, uh, that we deal with, challenges around resource allocation, human resource capacity, uh, decision making, and the chapter goes into some detail about how to address those challenges. And our hope is that this chapter will contribute to a better understanding of the way that others can build partnerships for um, sustainable development. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, the next speaker is Melissa Levine from the University of Michigan. So first I'd like to echo Padma's very um, beautiful gratitude, expression of gratitude for, for Maggie's work and for the other editor's work. Um, this has been a, a very long process and really a labor of love and commitment, I think, for many of the people involved with this project. So I am the director of the Copyright Office at the University of Michigan Library. There's probably 75 or 100 similarly situated people at, at North American libraries that I'm aware of. And um, our roles vary. Uh, I happen to be at, because I'm at the University of Michigan, I've had the opportunity to work really closely with Hathi Trust through its inception. And you may or may not know Hathi is a partnership now of, I'd say, over 200 library partners uh, committed to uh, primarily preservation of digital files from our libraries, um, but Im improving access where possible and a number of other things. So I looked at really uh, two kinds of partnerships. One was the set of relationships that were between Google and libraries, part particularly the University of Michigan in the famous or infamous, depending on how you look at it, Google Library Projects. Michigan was among the first libraries to agree to scan their collections with Google. And they, there were several very specific um, motivations for doing this. Um, the scale of investment that uh, Google was able and willing to make far exceeded the kind of scale that at least our library could have uh, engaged in on our own. So the opportunity pr presented allowed us to deal with, and I'm saying us is before I was there, the royal we. Um, we. We were able to deal with preservation, access, the aspiration of what we now call non-consumptive research, and accessible copies for people with print disabilities. Uh, these generally align with different aspects of the SDGs, particularly around education, knowledge access, and of course, access to material for people who have a variety of print disabilities and the inability to have access to uh, versions of books, let's just stick with books, um, in, uh, in formats that can be used by assistive uh, technologies, devices. Um, I focused on the library perspective because it's less known, I think. Um, and one of the key concerns that libraries had was something called the brittle books problem. And uh, m a vast majority of books on library shelves, 
printed in the better part of the 20th century have a known preservation problem. It's, you can take care of these, these documents for, for quite some time in appro appropriate um, settings, but they're degrading because there's a high level of acid in a lot of the paper that was used in the better part of the 20th century. So one of the concerns and one of the reasons this was so appealing was that we were able to at least make these digital surrogates of books that uh, we've retained um, uh, but uh, we're, we're are not going to survive as long as we might hope. I looked at um, what the library incentives were. I looked at what the mutual incentives were in, in, for Google in particular. Uh, they, they had, of course, uh, access to uh, the, the better part of, of, of North American research libraries, um, which allows a whole range of different kinds of research and products um, for them. Um, and I've already described the library's incentives. The key things that came out were really looking for what are the mutual incentives and uh, the, relationship, the, the, the relevance of personal relationships and trust in, in these kinds of uh, aspirational relations. Thank you so much. Uh, next speaker is Professor Fred Abbott. Well, thank you, Maggie. And, and like others, I, I'm very grateful for all the hard work and dedicated work that Maggie put into this book, along with Pedro Rafi and Ahmed Latif. Um, and um, my chapter uh, is almost exclusively devoted to the pharmaceutical sector and particularly research and development of pharmaceutical products. And um, it, it starts with a very basic premise that the idea of a distinction between pharma originator companies as institutional entities, public-private partnerships, and product development partnerships, the idea of a sharp distinction is largely a myth or an illusion. Um, all of these entities are essentially performing very similar functions um, with respect to the big pharma companies. And, and this is something that really became evident. I had happened to be while I was working on a report for the UK Commission on IP and Development um, some years ago, uh, was in discussing with the pharma companies to understand that while things may have been different in some age, uh, that in the modern context, the pharma companies are essentially acting as intermediaries or hubs. Uh, they're looking around the world at research that's being done. They're figuring out what's the most promising molecules under development. And then they're bringing those molecules eventually into the shop uh, and, uh, if uh, reasonably successful, transforming them into commercializable products. And Again, probably by historical accident, I also happen to have the good fortune to uh, be involved when the uh, Drug for De Neglected Diseases initiative was being formed, helping to de uh, develop their IP policy, and later similarly with the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics. So I got a pretty close look at what they were doing structurally as well, um, and come to the non-remarkable observation, really, that, that they are largely doing the same things as a big pharma company. Uh, they're looking out for promising molecules that can be converted into drugs. Uh, they're largely subcontracting out work. Uh, if a promising molecule is developed, then they're working on a marketing and distribution strategy. Um, so the, the question really becomes, well, what's the difference then in terms of what they're doing? Um, and in, in a nutshell, you could refer, to, you could think about it as the, the processes of, of capital aggregation, right? Where, where is the investment capital coming from on one side? And number two, what is the end product or, or motivation? And so in the uh, case of the big pharma companies, it's returning a profit and building shareholder value. And in a public-private partnership or PDP, the motivation tends to be non-profit. Um, with the big pharma companies, the capital is being aggregated through largely stock market issuances. And with the public-private partnerships, the capital is largely being aggregated through foundation and grant funds. Um, so the source of the capital 
tends to be different, the motivation is different, but the function is the same. And so the question becomes, is there, is there a way, so what is, if I'm looking at a problem, what is it? Is that in the functioning of the big pharma company, the revenues are being channeled outside the public benefit system in return of capital to shareholders, uh, and is there some way that we could reconstruct what the big pharma companies are doing through a different type of model that might involve R&D, for example, and then delinkage. And one question that the book asks is, you know, assuming a public partnership is more or less like a government bureaucracy, is there some way that we can make government bureaucracies or kind of nonprofits work with the same kind of energy and motivation as profit? companies. And so there's a lot of ambiguity about who's best at getting things done. Is it governments or is it the private sector? I then talk about, I'll be finished in 12 seconds, uh, talk then about uh, looking at how you would have an institutional framework to regulate a nonprofit hub and just suggest that there probably are different models that we could use that would do the same thing as the big pharma companies do, but differently. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, Mackie. Uh, this is a project uh, not only fun to read, but also fun to work on. Uh, so the editors actually spend a lot of time uh, from the workshop stage all the way to the editing process, the final product. Uh, so we appreciate what you guys have been doing. Uh, so Mackie asked me to write about something related to human rights. And so the chapter is devoted to the human rights obligations of the public, pan uh, public partnerships. And uh, those of you who are here are obviously aware of how the intellectual property system has impacted on the protection and promotion of human rights. But there are also a go, uh, a ongoing debate about how we also need to think about the IP-related aspects of human rights. And so some actually will go so far to say that IP should be considered as human rights. And so you see the duality right here and with respect to public-private partnerships, you have the similar duality there. Uh, so there are certain partnerships that will help to promote and protect human rights, but there are also partnerships that would help governments to avoid human rights obligations. And so I'm somewhat concerned about the latter, and so the chapter tries to take on that type of issues head on. And when I started the project, I actually thought that, well, there would be more resources I can rely on when writing about public-private partnerships. And to my surprise, there are actually not a lot of literature out there talking about the human rights obligations of public and private partnerships. So what I've ended up with the chapter is to detangle the different obligations. I started off with the human rights obligations for the public sector partner, and that is, uh, uh, has been widely covered uh, because it's basically about the governments, about the state actors, and so that's pretty easy. Uh, the second part is about the private sector partners. That's a little bit more complicated, but with the Rocky framework, with the gu uh, guiding principles, we also have emerging literature talking about the human rights obligations of transnational corporations. And I think the important takeaway is that the transnational corporations should not be able to avoid any human rights obligations. And I will also uh, uh, go a little bit further to talk about whether corporations can actually claim human rights protection with respect to IP aspects of human rights. Uh, but I think the most difficult part for me is about the human rights obligations for the public-private partnerships. So what I've done is basically separate the public sector partner, private sector partner, and then also look at the public-private partnership as a separate entity. So what I end up with is that the partnerships will have higher obligations than the private sector partners, but lower obligations uh, than the public sector partners. And the challenge for us is to figure out how we can uh, align the rugby framework and also the guiding principles to fit within that type of uh, obligations and entity. Uh, but after covering all the issues about the human rights obligations for the public private partnerships, I also devote some uh, space from the chapter to talk about what type of partnerships can actually help promote and protect human rights, and that's what I call PBP for human rights. And so there are three different types of partnership I've highlighted. Uh, the first one is we have partnership between governments and corporations, 
uh, working together, or the UN organization and corporations. And so think of Gavi, think of TB Alliance, think of a lot of those. Uh, that's the first type. The same type is between partnerships and um, uh, academics or advocacy organizations in developed countries. Uh, and I think Global Congress feature a lot of those partnerships. And I think they're very useful. And the last one is basically about the partnerships where uh, the governments work together with the corporations to actually promote intellectual property rights. And the emphasis there is about benefit sharing. So I think this chapter will be of interest to not only those interested in IP, but also those interested in PPP. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Maggie, and uh, uh, I also want to join in thanking the editors for the hard work to edit. It's an incredibly uh, tasking task, I know that very well, and uh, I have uh, enjoyed the process, and I really appreciate the editing and the accuracy of these editors in uh, putting a lot of time and giving us feedback. Uh, my chapter, um, co-author with Delphine Marie Vivienne, who is a specialist, uh, of, she is a science background and a specialist in geographic indication, combines our different skills um, and look at the governance of geographical indication. Um, I also want to thank the editors because before tackling this project, I have never really thought uh, about the governance. I have been writing extensively on GI from a legal uh, standpoint, from the trip standpoint, but I never really <coughs> stepped back and thought about governance. And I think what this paper, this book has made us, uh, many of us at least, uh, um, uh, realize is that how relevant is uh, the type of governance that governs a lot of this relationship uh, uh, between the public and the private, and sometime, of course, in the PPP, uh, a fusion of these two. Um, so in our chapters, what we have done, we have compared three uh, considerably different systems. One is France, one is uh, India, one is Singapore, uh, where uh, the reason why we selected this country is because they have very, um, very different systems in terms of governance. The law is the same, uh, very similar, sui generis protection for all, but um, in France we see a much more um, um, I would say uh, a grassroots movement. There is a long history of guilds in Europe, and so we really have a, a bottom-up approach where the government is less involved now, the state is far less involved in control uh, and in governance, even though they still appoint um, uh, private enterprises to check. So our book is, not, our chapter is not really focusing on PPPs in general very strictly, you look at governance that is often done through PPPs or through some sort of partnership between um, consumer as, uh, the producer association and then internal and external um, agencies that are uh, in charge of control. Sometimes these are public, sometimes these are private, sometimes these are a mix. Um, then we look at India that has a much more uh, top-down approach. Uh, and then we look at Singapore, it's a country that doesn't really care, doesn't have any, any GI, and uh, has to have a GI system because of the obligation based on trips, and because the European want it, and so they have to have it, otherwise they don't have an FTA with the European, but then they have to make the American happy, and so the American don't want it, and so they have to navigate as a sandwich in between these two big you know, the big blocks, and so that's really interesting, but it's most for them a pragmatic approach. Um, what was really interesting for me, and I think that ties briefly to the discussion of this morning panel, is to see um, that different countries have very different type of governance, even within the same type of legal framework. Uh, and I noticed, and um, I was, I've been doing lots of training on geographic indication for the uh, capacity building for uh, WIPO and the European IP office lately, and every time I go in developing countries, really a top down. It's completely Cambodia, I work a lot with Cambodia, I was working with Georgia, I've been done that in Malaysia and Indonesia, 
and there is really much more. The government picked the winners. We are going to develop this GI, that GI. If we don't have enough financial support, we're going to ask WIPO, we're going to ask the Europeans, we're going to ask the Japanese, we're going to ask people who are going to be able to help us. Uh, there is all sort of national foreign interests, like Cambodia has a lot of influence and money from France, for example, to develop GIs. Um, and, and so what is really interesting for me that I've learned is that PPPs in this area, as I assume in all areas, are dynamics. There is no one size fits all. And I'm really, again, very grateful to the editors because this work will continue in a volume that uh, we hope uh, we have to edit uh, for the ITCSD, in fact, uh, uh, looking much more deeper at the governance of geographic indications. So I'm really, really grateful uh, to have learned very much from you. Thank you again. So the book, as just highlighted, is about comparative governance and sustainable de development, but also about intellectual property. And as many of you know, there are different choices of intellectual property. One choice is prizes. And since it was a dark and stormy night, um, the Bulwer Lytton Prize has entrance invited, quote, to compose the opening sentence to the worst of all possible novels. And instead, this book has the prize of both being able to work with Maggie, to whom I'm always indebted, and work with a bunch of really good scholars to address the kinds of comparative institutional choices um, that we don't think through enough and, quite frankly, don't have enough data about to evaluate adequately. So I was asked with Maggie to focus on the Sustainable Development Goal 13, take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. Uh, needless to say, the urgency has only increased. Um, the chapter before ours, written by another of the editors, Anil Abdel Latif, focuses on bilateral and multilateral PPPs and gives much more concrete detail about those structures, particularly the China-US CERC and the India-US PACE uh, agreements and how those are structured. Um, and our chapter tends to take a slightly wider range of views, looking at the wide range of technologies and technology structures from infrastructure to monitoring, and how one starts to think about what choices need to be made. So we talk about what we call innovation policies, which one can think of as legal specification and innovation choices which tend to be administrative and private choices of implementation of those legal requirements and the different forms that can take, as well as possible uh, policies that are adopted within those forms. And what we emphasize is the need for d data on effectiveness of comparative institutional designs for both the development and transfer of climate change technologies. We raise a number of concerns about the laws and policies and innovation choices in PPPs that run potentially counter to the common but differentiated responsibilities. South-south um, flows of technology tend to be uh, relatively minor. South to north money is likely to transfer in the wrong direction relative to north to south technology transfers. There are concerns about exacerbating the imbalances of wealth and technological capacities that already exist in these dimensions. There are concerns about human rights and the prioritization of the efforts based on the funding and policy choices that are going to be made by these public-private institutional structures that are being developed under the UN um, framework convention, including the method of pooling the funds that um, Fred just mentioned and the way that they get dispersed, the choices of how to fund the technologies. Um, so to help assist understanding, the book provides a taxonomy of the kinds of funding choices and a few of the policy levers to consider um, at both the innovation policy and innovation choice levels of public-private partnership structure and implementation. But it doesn't really give concrete answers precisely because we don't have good comparative effectiveness data. And that's the area that I think is the most critical need right now, is to start generating some form of meaningful comparative effectiveness analysis for the structures that we're developing. 
Um, but mostly I just want to end that the, the prize is fun and it's a good read and uh, it's even more fun to work with Maggie, so I'll leave it there. Thanks so much. And our last but not least speaker is the back of the room. Thank you. Sorry for no, hiding no, you, Josh. No, um, no, no, no. I so, just get um, out of the way. Uh, in a sense, my chapter is, is, is a little bit different than some of the previous ones because I'm not an academic, so I'm a practitioner. I'm working in a, in a PPP or, or, or what, a, what a Pedro pointed out to me, one of the editors, that that is a PPP, so why don't you just tell the story of the medicines patent pool? Um, so that's what we try to do in this chapter is kind of tell the story, step back a bit from the promotional material of who we are, what we do, but kind of try to say, okay, what, what really is, what, how did this come about, why is it there, what is it doing, and, and, and where else can this model be applied? And that's what the chapter is a little bit about, um, analyzing patent pooling as a new type of PPP in public health. Um, and so there, there had been, back in the, from the kind of mid-2000s, calls for establishing patent pooling in the field of, of uh, public health. That had never really been done before. There were, of course, plenty of, of examples of patent pools in other areas of technology, and the most famous ones probably in, in the ICT industries with DVD and JPEG and all these kinds of patent pools, where you had a technical standard in place and you wanted to f somehow pool all the patents that were relevant for manufacturers to, to implement that standard. Um, and, and here, was the idea in, 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 in public health was actually quite different, was to try and uh, elaborate a mechanism for pooling relevant IP linked to specific pharmaceutical products, specific medicines, um, and, and make licenses available for which would really c focus on, 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 a, on a public interest uh, objective. So license, managing IP from a public health perspective rather than as you might do as a commercial entity. Uh, and that's what, what um, the, the first patent pool that was set up, which is the one I'm, I work with, Medicines Patent Pool, initially working just in HIV, trying to test the model, does this work? Uh, pooling different patents, allowing the development of new formulations, so new combination products that would put together different uh, active ingredients, or that would simply make accessible generic versions of that product in, in, in multiple countries. And, and really trying to understand how the model works, what are kind of the, the some of the principles around it. Uh, Maggie insisted a lot that I spell out a little bit more in the, in the, in the chapter, the, the, the principles around transparency, which has been a key point of, of the Medicines Patent Pool from day one, pre-committing to making every single one of our licenses public, something that had never really been done before in the pharmaceutical field. And it was interesting to really th think back on that because we, we just did it and, it, uh, and, and went on with it and, and, and somehow kind of extrapolated that what lessons can be drawn or not. Um, and I think what, what the chapter in the end tries to do is say, okay, well, this model worked in HIV or was being applied in the, in the field of HIV with certain lessons, certain successes, certain failures. Um, now at hepatitis C, uh, same kind of story. And now, wh wh where else is this, is, is this model applicable? And so we try to identify four kinds of, uh, of, of areas where it could potentially be applied. And, and I'll just spell these out without getting into any details. But the first one was where you're trying to enhance access to, um, to given uh, health products in limited resource, resource settings. So, so whether it's, it's, it's it's, it's poor countries or however else you might define it, poor, poor segments of, of, of the market. Um, and really licensing from a public interest perspective to enable uh, affordable access. Number two, patent pooling to facilitate further innovation, so follow on innovation. And we've, we've, we've been involved in that where we, you know, we, we, we negotiate a license and then a license that out to, to manufacturers who then develop a new formulation, a new combination, etc. Third, uh, where there's public investment going into the development of new products, you might want to combine that with, with public health licensing or patent pooling to ensure that that funding comes with certain strings attached and, and does result in access at the end of the day. And the fourth uh, is, is kind of more traditional patent pooling model of overcoming patent thickets. And there, are be, there have been instances where people have uh, uh, indicated that it would be relevant to establish a patent pool in those contexts uh, in the area of public health. So that's a little bit what, what we try to do in the chapter. Um, the, 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 I think the idea is, is really to see this as, as a different kind of patent pool than what we're used to and, and where you're really trying to manage IP from a public interest perspective through a public mechanism that is doing licensing with pharmaceutical companies and with all the challenges that that entails. Thank you.
into it whether I would actually enjoy it, but I learned so much from editing these chapters. And so I did really, in fact, love being an editor so much that I might think about doing another book at some <laughs> point, but not right away. Uh, and so um, we do, I also wanted to say that I didn't draw the connection to the SDGs as clearly as I should have. These partnerships are really highlighted in the 17th goal, SDG 17, and they're referred to as multi-stakeholder partnerships. Some of our authors have used the term cross-regional or cross-sector partnerships. Uh, we decided to pick us uh, to really focus on public-private partnerships or PPPs, but these partnership models are uh, quintessentially collaborative models of, of innovation, and so um, it's a very exciting area. I'm so glad to hear that we've seeded some further thoughts and further research uh, because that was our intent with this. Hopefully this presentation has also uh, inspired some thoughts, and we do have some flyers here for discounts on the book as well as a re review copy of the book available near the registration desk so please go ahead and take a look at the book or um, I'm happy to give you a flyer after this presentation is over and please if if anyone took that second review copy or display copy please return it um, so thank you again for attending this and um, I hope to talk about some of this with some of you afterwards thank you pardon Peter? Uh, will it undermine Peter the wholesale too much?